Baruch ben Yosef. And he, maybe more than anyone else, shows the level of impunity enjoyed by the Kahanist movement in Israel. So who is this man, Baruch ben Yosef? In 1985, Baruch ben Yosef, working with two other American-born Kahanists, Robert Manning and Keith Fuchs, they, according to the FBI, they assassinated this man, Alex Sodeh. Now, who is Alex Sodeh? A Palestinian, born in the West Bank, and at that time, there was no Palestinian university. To speak. He was only a couple kilometers away from uh, Birzeit, but Birzeit wasn't a university then, so he had to go to Cairo to do his BA, and then he went to America to do his master's, and then he decided to stay there, immigrated, uh, got his citizenship, and was one of the first recruits of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. What is this? Um, think, at that time, uh, probably not so different from the times we're living in, but at that time, there was like a lot of racism towards Arab folks. In, in the United States, the idea of Arab people was you know, generally negative, at least the media images were, and these were the ideas that you know, kids were growing up on, whether it was with art or cartoons or Hollywood movies. There were generally negative images that people were being subjected to. And so you know, groups like the ADC, their goal was to change that, you know, to put out positive images of Arab people. And also, it should be said, and we're talking about the mid-80s, this is a time that's really the first efforts by Arab Americans to organize politically. So what we see is at that time in 1985, the ADC taking out full-page ads in the Washington Post and other newspapers saying, you know, well, maybe we shouldn't be spending all this money and sending billions of dollars every year to the Israeli military. Maybe we ought to be spending some of that money on our own youth, you know, on our senior citizens. And because of this, because really for the first time, this is, you know, an effort to change the narrative, to challenge the dominance that the Zionist narrative had enjoyed in, the, in Washington, D.C. And so because of this, the, the ADC was perceived as a threat. And that's why Alex Ode had to be killed, I guess. That's why the Kahanists killed him. They started off by, you know, th threatening him, and they'd call him on the regular and threaten him. And I found this evidence in their own files of, of, of it. But, but on October 11th, 1985, later that day, he actually was supposed to speak at a local synagogue he was doing intersectional work before we even had that name for it uh, because he really believed in that our safety is in solidarity, working with other communities, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. But that day, he walks into his office, and it exploded. Of course, this was you know, highly traumatic for his community and for his family, uh, but for the Jewish Defense League, uh, the national chair at that time, Irv Rubin, said, well, he got exactly what he deserved. So, this is how, in America, they took the life of a Palestinian man. But, you know, it's not only in America where they're operative. You know, now the Kahanist movement is in Israel, and its record in Israel is horrific. You know, they have the, uh, uh, the status of having, you know, the, the biggest body count on their hands, you know, in their history. This is Hebron. Right, this is the largest Palestinian population center in the West Bank. And this is, uh, we're looking at the Ibrahimi Mosque, or the Cave of the Patriarchs. This is a site that's holy to Jews and Muslims. And in 1994, uh, a Kahanist walks in to the mosque, and he just sprays everyone with bullets. It's the Friday of Ramadan, and so it was full up with Palestinian men and boys. And he killed 29 and you know, injured over 100. And, and the murderer was this man, Baruch Goldstein, another American-born follower of Mir Kahana. He had even run for Knesset on Kahana's party, for Kahana's party. Now, at this point, the Israeli government understands belatedly, but finally begins to understand what it's dealing with. At that point, Rabin is in power, and he realizes we're talking about a terrorist group in every sense of the word. And as such, they need to be treated as terrorist groups are treated. And so, finally, the Israeli government rounds up the leaders of the Kahana movement, rounds them up into jail, 
and it puts them in administrative detention. I don't know if people here are familiar with that term. Uh, it's like a draconian, you know, some, it's kind of a, a holdover from British colonialism when you would arrest people on suspicion of terrorism. You don't need to show any evidence, at least not to them. You just put them behind bars and they can be there for months at a time and there's no recourse. They don't have, it's not without any habeas corpus or any of those uh, regulations. So finally, in 1994, they round up the leadership of the Kahanists. Now, in the Knesset, the Likud is outraged. Here's Limor Livnat, and she's, you know, in a huff and a puff. How dare you? What are you doing? How can you arrest these people and put them behind bars without any, you know, recourse? And, uh, well, Israel's police minister at that time, Rabin's police minister, Moshe Shacha, eh, calm down, Limo. I mean, you're looking at me like we're doing something wrong here. After all, it was a Likud government that used administrative detention for the first time against Jewish Israeli citizens. When was that? In 1980, against Rabbi Kahana, against Rabbi Baruch Ben Yosef Green. Against that same Baruch Ben Yosef. What does this mean? I'm talking about the assassin of Alex Aude, who then immediately after the murder, fled right back to Israel and has been living in Israel ever since that time. Where is he? Where is he? Why isn't he sent back to the U.S. to serve time, to stand, for ju- you know, to stand trial for the murder of Alex Odeh? Well, if, if the Israeli government claims they don't know where he is, I'll tell you where he is. He's in Israel's jails. Twice. He actually holds the record. He is the Israeli Jew who has sat in administrative detention more than any other citizen in the history of the state. So now you're going to tell me you don't know where he is? You had him in your jail. You were holding him there. Uh, it, it gets worse, if you can imagine this. So that's 94. Three years later, December 97, the Mordi Vnat, she's now cut her hair short, and she's now Minister of Communications. So she comes to the USA, and she visits this man. You remember him? I don't know if this is going to be familiar to some of y'all. This is Jonathan Pollard. Very brief tangent, but Pollard was an American Jew who worked in U.S. naval intelligence and spied for Israel on the U.S. government, uh, passed information to Israel, and so eventually he was caught, sentenced to jail. But, you know, to the Israeli right, he's a hero. And so, you know, I guess Limo Livnat is a, uh, you know, fights for the rights of Jewish prisoners. And so she comes to the U.S. and she brings, she meets with Pollard and she brings with her a letter from Netanyahu, a letter of support. And Netanyahu writes to Pollard saying, I sincerely hope that our continued efforts on your behalf will bear fruit. Okay, that's the Pollard incident. I'm going to put a point on that and come back to it in a sec. So three weeks later, Netanyahu himself comes to the U.S. This is now January 1998. Netanyahu is now prime minister. Okay, and he comes to the U.S. for talks with the White House. So he's in Washington, D.C., and he's at the National Press Club giving a press conference. And now he's asked about this. What about the murder of Alex Odeh? I mean, according to the FBI, these are the killers. They fled to Israel. What are you doing about it? You know, why isn't there any justice? And so Netanyahu says, well, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I know about the case of Alex Odeh, but didn't we send you the murderer already? Didn't We sent you Robert Manning. We extradited him back to the U.S. But Israel extradited him for a different murder a murder that he'd committed years previous that had nothing to do with the, you know, uh, it was just a murder for hire. It was a murder for money. And he, in fact, is sitting in an American jail till this day. But he never, sat tri- he never stood trial for the murder of Alex Sode. And besides the fact, there's two others. The questioner then goes on, presses him, says, you know, okay, so here's Manning today, still in jail. But then the questioner asks him, well, Keith Fuchs and Andy Green are apparently still in Kiryat Arba. That's the, you know, the Kahanist... Uh, enclave outside of Hebron, and uh, the Justice Department has not received full cooperation at all from the Israeli government on this matter. What's Netanyahu's response? Incidentally, you can go online afterwards and watch the video on C-SPAN to verify it for yourself. I'm not just making it up. Netanyahu's response is, I assure you that our policy is to cooperate fully with the murderers. Now, okay, I can already hear someone in the audience must be saying, no, Bichyad, come on, David, really? This is obviously just a slip of the tongue. I mean, it's easy for anyone who, you know, to make a mistake and to just, you know, slip up and say the wrong thing. And admittedly, he 
responded, you know, right afterwards he followed this up with boilerplates, you know, oh, of course we don't discriminate against Jews or Arabs, we arrest everyone, who's go, okay, fair enough. Um, but in evaluating whether or not this was some kind of Freudian slip, we need only look a few months into the future. So this press conference is in January 98. November 98, Netanyahu is in court. Why? He's now being sued by that same Jonathan Pollard. Okay, Netanyahu sent him a letter of support, but that's not enough. He's still rotting away in a U.S. jail. He's pissed, you know? Here I am, sitting in a U.S. jail, and I could be here for the rest of my life. When's Netanyahu going to actually stand up and claim me as an Israeli agent, and maybe in that way, perhaps I could be repatriated to Israel? And this is what he wants, and so he's now demanding, he's now suing Netanyahu in Israeli court, demanding that, you know, and this case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. So now, Netanyahu is in the Supreme Court defending himself from a lawsuit from Jonathan Pollard. And who do you think the lawyer would? Yeah, people generally uh, suspected Alan Dershowitz would have been the lawyer, but no, actually, it was this man. That same Baruch Ben Yosef. He's now reinvented himself. He went to law school, got his law degree, and he's now suing Netanyahu, filing suit against him in an Israeli court, and it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. Ten months earlier, Netanyahu's like, oh, I have no idea where these guys are. Oh, the assassins of Alex Sode. Who knows where they could be anywhere? No idea where they might be. They're suing you in court. You really expect me to believe you don't know where he is? He's the person standing in front of you in court. That's where he is. And Netanyahu just covers for him and expects us all to believe that he has no idea. This is the level of impunity that the Kahanist movement operates in to the highest levels of power. Are you starting to understand this? So Baruch Ben Yosef, of course, today, he continues uh, to be, uh, he's argued at this point dozens of times in front of Israel's Supreme Court. Um, he's sued not just Netanyahu, he's sued several Israeli prime ministers and more ministers, but of course continuing to return to the Dome of the Rock that he tried to blow up back in 1980 on the regular. But remember, I said there were two who are still in Israel, and the other one is Keith Fuchs. Well, he's still living in Israel, he's still showing up at the Dome of the Rock whenever he can. He's now changed his name to Israel Fuchs, but um, in some ways, the level of impunity he's enjoyed uh, are even more disgusting than those enjoyed by Baruch Ben Yosef. So in recent years, Fuchs actually got together with four other men, also uh, members of a Kahanist front group, Komemiut, and they established an NGO called Meshilut, of course, with money from Netanyahu's bag man. This is Ken Abramovitz, the head of Likud USA, so the biggest funder of Netanyahu's Likud party, right? So the funder of the Likud party funds Israel Fuchs and together they form Meshilut, this NGO that is today authoring legislation in the Israeli Knesset, writing the rules and having members of Knesset pass them, becoming law. And here is Israel Fuchs sitting in a meeting of the Israeli Knesset committee. That's the level of impunity 